Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Lindsay Robinson. I'm the Executive Director of the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, we are very excited for all of you to be here. This is our, our very first webinar. Uh, so we're, we're hoping it's going to be a very uh, smooth transition. Um, but just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first off, I would like to introduce um, our, our wonderful colleague, uh, Lori Ajax, who is Chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Uh, she will be leading this webinar today, and uh, we're very excited to have her in our office to shoot this. We're going to um, be going through a PowerPoint presentation that Lori and her team have put together um, for all of you, and uh, we will be allowing questions. Um, so we're going to take questions, uh, written questions, and you can do that through the GoToWebinar side panel. Um, what, we'll get to questions uh, once we get through the presentation. We'll have a QA and a uh, for 20 to 30 minutes um, at the end of the webinar. Um, if anyone is having any audio issues, um, you can feel free uh, to message us and we'll, we'll try to fix things on our end, but hopefully everyone um, is able to hear us okay and see us okay. Um, and yeah, we're going to get started in just one minute. Uh, we've got um, a, about 120 um, attendees who have RSVP'd, uh, so we're just waiting for more folks to join. But um, for those of you who are just logging on, uh, welcome to the CCIA uh, webinar featuring um, Lori Ajax, the Chief of um, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. My name is Lindsay Robinson. We're very excited to have all of you. So we're going to get started in just a minute. Again, if you need to, um, if you'd like to send any questions, we ask you to use the GoToWebinar uh, portal for questions. You can type all those out and uh, we'll try to get to them towards the end of the session. So we have Lori for about an hour uh, and we're very grateful for you to be taking the time to be in our office today. Um, I say we get started. Okay. Shall we? Yes. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, CCIA. I'm happy to be here on the first webinar, so it's pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> so, um, I'm as most of you know, our regulations, our emergency regulations, were finalized last Thursday, so they are all out there on our website. And then I'm going to take us through a, a high-level overview of our regulations, and then we'll, as Lindsay said, we'll take questions. So we'll get started. So. As most of you know, we're now operating under one set of statutes, which is the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act, and that's a single regula regulatory system for both medicinal and adult use, and that our emergency regulations are, are the requirements for the licensees for both the medicinal and adult use market. Um, it's important to know that anybody engaged in commercial cannabis activity needs to be licensed starting January 1st of 2018. And as most of you know, it does allow for local jurisdictions to control what activities are permitted um, at, their, uh, at the local level. And of course, we place the highest protection of public protection as our highest priority. So, and a lot of you already know what the administrative structure is. So right now I'm gonna be talking about um, our role and we license the distributors, the retailers, the micro businesses, the testing laboratories, and then the temporary cannabis events. Uh, and another thing is it's important to know like commercial cannabis activity, you know, in, includes cultivation, possession, manufacture, distribution, processing, storing, all of those things that you see on that slide, but it does not include personal use cultivation that is done at a private residence. So somebody doing that does not need to get a license with for commercial cannabis activity. Uh, another thing is, is once we do license uh, folks on January 1st, 2018, then they can only deal with other licensees. And I know uh, that's an important piece of this. That's why we're really trying to get as many temporaries issued as possible on January 1st of 2018. So, um, 
you know, all, all, all businesses conducting commercial act commercial cannabis activities will need to be licensed and a separate license is required for each location. Uh, there is an exception to that and I'll go over that in a little later in our slides, but we do get a lot of questions on is the Bureau having any limits on the number of licenses they're going to issue. We, do, we are not setting any caps for the licenses that the Bureau will be issuing. Um, however, at the local level, they may have limits on the number of, you know, for example, retailers they have. If they have a limit in place, um, for example, I think San Jose has 16 retailers, the Bureau could not issue any more in that jurisdiction for retailers. Um, and, the, and you can hold any license type with the exception of the testing laboratory. Uh, you can hold multiple testing laboratory licenses, but you, if you're a testing lab, you can't hold any other license other than the testing lab. So we will be issuing temporary licenses. Um, we are going to start hopefully uh, issuing licenses prior to January 1st, but they'll have an effective date of January 1st, 2018. So there's nobody that's going to have a, a license with an effective date prior to January 1st. Uh, the temporary is good for 120 days and you can submit your temporary license on, the, on our online system and we also have paper applications available and the the, uh, the most important thing on getting a temporary, and this is in the statute, is that you must have a copy of the license permit or other authorization from the local jurisdiction. Um, at the time you uh, apply for a temporary, you can also apply for your annual license. An annual license uh, is going to be valid for one year. and. Um, it's a little bit different. You don't have to provide us with a copy of the license permit or other authorization, but we cannot issue a license if it violates any local jurisdictions, regulations, or ordinances. Uh, so these are the requirements right now uh, for our temporary license application and the things you're going to need. I'm, I'm going to uh, I think CCIA is going to put a copy of this PowerPoint on their website mm -hmm. and we're also going to put one on the Bureau's website um, after this presentation. So this will all be available to you. Um, I think the, the most important thing that, you know, I'll, I'll say again is one of the few things you are going to have to have is that uh, license permit, uh, license permit or other authorization from the locals. We also need uh, evidence that the property owner is allowing for you to use that uh, property for commercial cannabis activity and a premises diagram. Uh, it's a fairly uh, easy process and again it's good for that 120 days and after, during that 120 days it is required that you have to submit your annual application and if we have not been able to issue that annual application within that 120 days, we can extend that temporary for an additional 90 days. And we can continue to do that. Um, uh, we're hoping to get these annuals out in a timely manner, but just in case, um, we, we, there is multiple times that we can extend that. If, uh, of course, if it's on, on the Bureau's side that that delay is happening. So most of you know we launched our online system on December 8th, last Friday. Uh, in order to access our system and get to um, the license types, you will have to log in and sign and, and become a registered user. So you're going to have to log in with your email address and a password. And then once you get your, uh, your registered users, then you can get to the screens where it has where you apply for the license. Uh, one thing to note, the the temporary cannabis event organizer, that is not available on the online system. That is a paper application at this time. So you can uh, download it and either submit it uh, through email or you can mail it to us. Uh, we do expect to have that in our online system probably uh, late January when we go through our next enhancement with our IT system, but at this time that's not available there. Uh, at, you know, I will say this, as of uh, I, early this morning we had over 1,600 registered users on our licensing system, so that's great. So I would encourage people to go out there at least uh, start looking at our site and maybe get registered and then look um, at what you're going to need to submit that temporary. 
So these are the different license types that the Bureau will be issuing and for each uh, license category, depending if you're going to do medicinal or an adult use, you will need a separate license for each. So for example, if you're going to be a distributor and you're going to be doing both uh, medicinal and adult use distribution, then you'd need a separate Type 11M and a Type 11A for each of those activities. So for each, so for uh, compliance with the local jurisdiction, uh, if you provide us um, with your temporary, you're going to have to provide us with your license permit or other authorization. Uh, we will then have to, we are required to notify the local jurisdiction uh, that you have applied for that temporary and that you've submitted uh, either a license permit or some sort of authorization from that local jurisdiction. Uh, they have 10 days to respond to the Bureau, so they can, they can respond prior to that 10 days and say, yes, that is valid, or they can tell us it's not valid. But they do have 10 days uh, to respond. If we do not hear back from the local jurisdiction, then we consider the authorization valid. So I think it is important to note now that um, we're getting closer to January 1, please remember that we're going to have to give the locals 10 days. So, you know, if, if you are in contact with your local jurisdiction and when we go out there and email them this notice, it would be helpful to even to tell them, hey, can you get back to the Bureau? Because if they get back to us prior to the 10 days and everything else is in order, we're going to be able to issue that temporary. And like I said, we really want to get as many people as we can issued a license so they can continue operations on January 1st. Now, once, for, once we get into the annual licenses, uh, the, we still, if you want to provide us with your local license permit or authorization, you may, but for the annual uh, license, we cannot require you to provide that information. So we would, if we get that from you, then we would still go out and, and, and contact the locals and notify them and give them that 10 days. However, if you don't provide that to us on your annual license and that's not submitted to us, then the local, we have to notify the locals and they have 60 days to respond to us. So um, we then wait that 60 days and once again, they have 60 days to respond. If we don't hear back from them, then we can presume compliance and then we can go forward and issue that license. So each, I think I was mentioning each premises requires a license. There is an exception to that. Uh, if, for example, if you're a retailer and you want to uh, conduct both adult uh, use sales and medicinal sales, you can in the same premises. So you can have an A and an M retail license in the same premises, as long as it's the same ownership and you're doing the same commercial activity. So the same would apply for a distributor. If you're going to get a distributor A and an M, that can be on the same premises. It can be the exact same premises. Uh, it just has to be the same ownership. Uh, you know, you cannot have um, a cannabis uh, licensee located within 600 feet of a school unless the local jurisdiction permits that. And we would require some kind of evidence from the local jurisdiction that they are allowing that. Uh, you'll be required to provide us with a premises diagram, and as I said earlier, you also have to have the landowner approve the cannabis activity that's being conducted on the property. Uh, each licensee must have a $5,000 surety bond to cover the cost of destruction of cannabis goods, and then all licensees are going to have to enter in certain events into the track and trace system. We do get a lot of questions on ownership, and I suspect some of the questions, we're going to have a lot of questions from everybody about ownership. So that does mean a person that has an aggregate interest of 20% or more in the cannabis business. Uh, it can be a CEO of a nonprofit or other entity or a member of the board of directors of a nonprofit, or it can be an individual who are will be participating in direction control or management of the business. And then this, this is going to be determined by you, the applicant. Um, we have to have at least one member that meets this definition because we have to have somebody to license. So 
I know there's a, a lot of questions on because there's some really complex corporate structures out there and I want to say uh, we've been working through this with several people have contacted us or email us and the best way to reach us right now is the BCC at dca.ca.gov email address. Uh, we have our legal staff. Um, they are responding to these emails and it's a we're trying to get back to people within the same day if not maybe you know usually within 24 hours we're getting back to you so some for some of these complex uh, legal structures we're happy to to work with you on who should be uh, considered an owner all owners are going to have to submit fingerprints to us and then also anybody with a financial interest is going to be, even if they're not 20% or more, they're not considered an owner, but they have some kind of financial interest, they're going to have to be disclosed on the application. Uh, here's an example of like the premises diagram. Uh, we're already uh, seeing a, a lot of you have already submitted your temporary application, so we're seeing diagrams, and you may be getting contact by our licensing staff, maybe asking for more details, uh, but we are asking that you show the, all the areas where you're going to conduct commercial cannabis activity. So you, we're going to want to see exits, entrances, all the rooms, windows, doorways, and then we want you to describe what's going on in that area. You know, is it going to be your retail area? Is going to, if you're a retailer, it's going to be a limited access area. So we want that to be identified. Um, and also where all the camera locations are going to be. So as we're seeing a lot of diagrams come in right now, and that's not on the diagram. So what we'll do when we get these things, we'll be communicating with you by email and just explaining what it is we need. These are some of the applicant application requirements that apply for all licensees. Um, one thing we're finding and when people are starting to navigate our annual license system, I think they're getting confused. Um, there is the general information and then just the information that an owner needs to submit. So when you go on our online licensing system, uh, you, can, you can have the applicants going to apply and then they're going to identify who the owners are and provide that email address. Then that owner is going to get a separate email and they're gonna be asked to do what we call an owner submittal. So they're gonna to have to identify uh, their, their information, you know, their name, their social security number, they're gonna to have to provide their government uh, ID and then identify their percentage of ownership. And that's where we're gonna send you uh, the fingerprint form to go to the live scan station to get fingerprinted and then also uh, uh, identify any criminal convictions and that is just for each individual owner they'll get an email separately so here's the financial interest because we get a lot of questions on this so a financial interest is an investment in a commercial cannabis business, a, a, perhaps a loan or any other equity interest. And it does not include a bank or financial institution or folks that are in a diversified mutual, mutual fund or blind trust. And anybody with shares of stocks that are less than 5% of the total shares in a publicly traded company. But for everybody else, uh, the applicant will have to disclose all the financial interest of the people who aren't owners and give us their name, their birth date, and also uh, their government issued identification. So I'll, I'll briefly go through the different license types. Um, first we have the distributor and uh, that the distributor is the only licensee that can transport cannabis goods between licensees. So uh, they, you must have a distributor's license if you're going to transport between licensees. The only exception that, to that is the lab, uh, the laboratories, when they go to pull the sample from the distributor, they can transport that sample back to the lab without having a distributor's license. So that's the only exception to that. So the, the full distributor license is, is, is 
has the privilege to transport cannabis goods between licensee. They arrange, they're the ones that have to arrange for the testing lab to come out and pull the sample. And then they conduct all the quality assurance review of the cannabis goods to make sure that they're complying with all the packaging and labeling. And then they're going to be doing some of the storage of goods. Uh, we have it. We created a new license type, and I think most of you have saw it. It's the distributor transport only, and because we had a lot of folks talk about that they don't want to do all of those functions of a full distributor, they just want to transport cannabis. So the distributor transport only is allowed to transport cannabis goods between licensed cultivator, manufacturers, and distributors. They're not allowed to transfer goods to the retailer because it still has to go through the full distributor to make sure that the product gets tested and goes through all those quality assurances. Um, the only exceptions to this is that if you're a licensed nursery with the California Department of Food and Ag, you can transport immature live plants and seeds uh, to the retailer. So that's the one exception. So these are some of the vehicle requirements that we have for our transporter and Important to note that nobody under 21 can be in the vehicle and it can only be the licensee or their employer in there. So for the retailer, we have two license types. So we have the storefront retailer that's open to the public and this is, they sell cannabis goods to the customer and they can also deliver cannabis goods uh, to the customer. Um, then we have the non-storefront uh, retailer and that is delivery only. Uh, it still has to have a licensed premises, so you still have to have a, a brick and mortar uh, premises, except for it will not be open to the public. Um, we do have operation hours from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And, uh, you know, I've listed some things there. You know, all cannabis goods before they leave the premises have to be in opaque exit packaging. Uh, any deliveries have to be made by the employee of the retailer and deliveries must be to a physical address. And some of this stuff was in our draft medical regulations. Uh, for instance, uh, in any delivery vehicle, they can't contain any more than $3,000 of cannabis products at any time. And that's $3,000 in retail value. And the retail also needs to know where all the delivery of vehicles are at any time. Uh, Retailers will not be able to package or label cannabis goods. Uh, the regulations uh, only allow them to accept uh, goods once in their final sale, package for their final sale. So when you start buying from the distributor, you have to buy product that's ready to be sold in their final, uh, final form. Uh, the exception to that is we do have a transition period laid out in our regulations because we know a lot of you will have uh, retailers will have an inventory loose flower and so for six months you are allowed to deplete that inventory and continue to package and label that but once that inventory is deleted then any product you get has to be uh, pre-packaged and you won't be able to package or label on the retail premises. The micro businesses uh, that allows for four different types of commercial cannabis activity. So cultivation up to 10,000 square feet, uh, manufacturing, you can do uh, non-volatile extraction, infusion, packaging, or labeling, and full distribution and retail. So in order to qualify for one of those licenses, you will have to engage in at least three out of those four activities. <laughs> you tell us which three, or you could do all four if you want to. Um, you're going to indicate that in our application and then you're going to have to meet all the requirements for whatever activities you choose to engage in. Uh, so, and, and there, I know there's a lot of interest out there and we do get a lot of questions on that. And one of the things we get a lot, can you distribute other people's products as a micro business? And you can. You can distribute your own product, but you can also distribute other people's products. And then the temporary cannabis event license. So this is for any type of temporary event up to four days. And it does allow on-site sale and consumption, but it has to be on a fairground. So similar to where we were uh, last Sunday at the Emerald Cup, uh, that would 
qualify for a temporary cannabis event. Um, so in order to get approval to do an event on a fairgrounds, you first have to apply to be an organizer of the event. So that would be the first step. You have to get a cannabis event organizer license. And as I said at the beginning, that is a paper application at this time. It, it's a fairly straightforward and simple application, but that is gonna have to be on paper, uh, at least for the next month and a half or so. Um, it does allow the sale of cannabis goods by any licensed retailer or micro business that is approved to do retail. And uh, it can only be events for people that are 21 or older, and, but it does allow for on-site consumption. Uh, it doesn't allow for the consumption of alcohol or tobacco on the premises. Um, and so those, um, I, we, we expect to get a lot of those actually. So, and then finally, uh, we are also regulating the testing laboratories. And as most of you know, um, everything is going to have to be tested. Uh, that'll be that those batches will go to the distributor and then they will call the testing lab to come pull the sample. Uh, we've listed in this uh, down below all the different things that will need to be tested for. And in our regulations, we've actually uh, have outlined a phase in period for all of these tests. So not everything is gonna be required on January 1, but in our regs, you'll see what tests are required uh, for the first four months, then the second, and then the third. So finally, our licensing fees. So I, I didn't, I'll say this for the temporary license, it is free. See, I know, everybody, I don't know that people <laughs> believe me when I say that, but it, it is free. And there's no application fee either for the temporary. So there, you don't have to pay the, the application fee, you don't have to pay a licensing fee. So. Uh, but for the annual application, there is an application of $1,000 that applies to all three licensing authorities. And then the licensing fees are all outlined in our regulation. The amount of the licensing fee is based on the size of the business. And so all of that is out there on our regulation. And then we don't require the licensing fee to be paid at the time you apply for your annual application. That'll, you only have to do the application fee at that point. Once we say the license is going to be approved, we'll then send you an email and say, we're gonna approve the license. And at that time you pay the licensing fee. So this is our web, our Bureau website, uh, the Cannabis Portal, and all of our social media. And uh, once again, uh, we we also have an email address where we're responding to questions, and uh, we can we'll put that on there too. It's uh, it's bcc at dca.ca.gov. And so um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take some questions. Excellent. Thank you. That was. An amazing amount of information. We have a ton of questions that have come in. Um, first off, uh, I'm going to try and, and, and group the, the questions together. So um, if your question does not fully get answered, uh, don't worry. All of these questions are going to be given to uh, the Bureau to review. Um, and uh, so hopefully, uh, if it's not answered by us today, um, it might be addressed in, in some of the frequently asked questions that I know that they're, they're compiling. Um, yeah, and also as well, um, as many of you know, we are doing two additional webinars um, directly after this, one with the folks from Department of Public Health, which will be um, addressing the emergency regulations around manufacturing, and then we also have um, the folks from the um, CDFA coming in this afternoon um, to discuss uh, cultivation regulations. So um, I will try to get some of these questions over to them as well. Um, but first off, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the emergency regulations go into effect on January 1st. Um, what can you talk a little bit about the formal rulemaking process that will come afterwards that will um, help determine the final regulations and what that time frame looks like? Yes, so our emergency regulations, um, even though they have been finalized and they will become effective January 1st of 2018. And so 
really it's going to be immediately in January we're going to have to then start the formal rulemaking process and so what you're going to see is once again we're going to notice when we start the formal rulemaking <clears throat> pro process to everybody uh, we are currently pre preparing a e economic assessment that we have to include in the formal rulemaking uh, process uh, once we complete that we will notice the public and then we'll immediately start public comment hearings. So probably right now we're probably looking at late February or March. Okay. We'll be going around the state similar to what we did with our medical regulations that we released. And so we'll be going to different areas of the state and we'll be taking public comment. Also take it through, you know, you can, you know, email or write us, but, uh, and that'll start a 45 day comment period. So then anything you see in our emergency regulations that you feel is not working for you or you're, you're, you don't, you disagree with, uh, that would be the time to provide us that public comment. Once that 45 day comment is over, we will look at all the comments, we will respond to public comment, and then you may see us make changes. And depending on how substantial those changes are, we either have to go back out for a 45 day comment period if they're really major substantial uh, changes to the regs. If they're minor changes, it usually is just going to be a 15 day public comment period. Again, we'll take comment, respond to those comments, and then complete rulemaking. Um, so it's possible we have a couple of comment periods and then the goal is to get the final regulations. We have to have them finalized. We have uh, 360 days. So by the end of next year, they have to be finalized. Great, thank you. Um, we're also getting some questions from folks about um, the definition of premise. Maybe you could review that a little bit um, and just go into some detail about uh, what is going to constitute uh, premise. And um, maybe even th that might be a good time to touch on co-location sure. as well. We, we're getting some questions on that. Yeah, we, it, it is, it, it gets hard because I what we consider a premise is really is when you, when you go online, we have a diagram form and it is what you describe to us as your licensed premises. That's where you're conducting the commercial cannabis activity. So you detail to us, this is where, so if you're a retailer, you're gonna say, this is where I'm conducting my commercial cannabis activity and that is going to be your premise. If you're going to be a retailer and you're gonna have both medicinal and adult use, which is two separate licenses, we are going to allow you to utilize that same premise that you outlined for both licenses as long as it's uh, the same ownership. And that applies for all of our bureau licenses. Uh, I think what the, the confusion comes into, some of you are applying for multiple licenses. So for each license type, you could be have multiple licenses on the same property, but you're going to have a different premise. You're going to outline a different premises. So perhaps you're going to do manufacturing, cultivation, and retail. You're going to describe to public health the premises for manufacturing for their licensing, and usually that's going to require some separation, and it's really going to depend on the activity you're doing. Uh, so you know if you're you know doing a manufacturing license and you're using volatile you know, solvents, you might have to have a different delineation between that and the retailer than we would for, let's say, distributor. But for the most part, there's going to have to be some separation. Okay. Great. Thank you. And um, if you are, say, if you have a license for manufacturing and you have a license cultivation, um, will you, and they're not on the same premises, will you need either a distributor or a transport license to get product from A to B? Yes, and okay. and you know uh, the the way the statute's written, you have to the only a distributor can transport cannabis. So is I know it sounds crazy that you you you're almost literally walking a product across the way, but you still need a distributor. Okay, great. Um, what information will retail stores need to collect on medical patients, and how long will they have to keep those records for? Um. 
you know, I, I, that one, I know that I, I'll have, I know we're requiring them to get their name, but they can also use, they can also identify them by a, a customer number. Uh, I, I can, we'll, we'll send something out uh, off the top of my head. I don't remember what, I, I believe all of the records were requiring seven years, including mm -hmm. that, that they have to store them, but I'll double check on that. That, that includes the patient information. Okay, great. Um, and for those of you who um, joined a little bit late, we are going to have um, this webinar up on the CCIA website, um, and the PowerPoint presentation will also be available on the Bureau of Cannabis Control website. Um, so you'll have access to that information if you if you joined us a little bit late. Um, great. I know that we've had. Um, questions about felony convictions and um, folks' ability to still apply for a license? Yeah, anybody can apply for a license. And I would encourage, I know sometimes I think people that have felony convictions are worried about applying for a license. And I would say, uh, please apply. Um, we're going to look at these things. Obviously, it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But I mean, we want to bring people in the regulated market. So we're going to be looking at a number of things um, when we look at convictions. Uh, uh, we're going to look at, you know, things like at the time that it was considered a felony, a lot of these convictions are at this point in time are no longer considered a felony or what was the length of or. So I, we're going to, we're going to be very flexible. So I, I, I really can't stress this enough. I don't think you were, you just go ahead and apply and then we're going to ask you if we need any other information, but I just want people to know we, we want people to get into the regulated market. So great. Thank yeah. you. Um, so we have a question here about a type nine storefront business that is not open. How is the um, not open to the public defined? Meaning if could they have an employee holiday party where folks bring guests or is it strictly um, would that type of activity be off limits at a non storefront? Yeah, you know, so we look at not open to the public, meaning when you're conducting commercial cannabis activities, you're not have there at no time would somebody be coming to a non storefront delivery and buying cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just having like holiday party and it's closed to the public, I, I don't think that would be an issue okay. and, unless your local jurisdiction somehow restricted that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to know. Everybody has to follow across the state, the, the state's regulations, but any local jurisdiction can be more restrictive. Mm -hmm. So it's always important to know what they're requiring. Yes. Um, and the next one kind of goes along with this, I think, with the local um, permits in, on, on, about on-site consumption. Yes. Um, are, have you seen that most locals are, are allowing them at this point or not? You know, I, I no, we haven't, you know, since we haven't issued any licenses yet, we, we don't know, uh, but that is, uh, that is a local control. But I think there there is a lot of jurisdiction that understand that since you can't uh, consume or inhale or smoke cannabis in public, there is a need to have places where people can consume cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I think I think you're going to see locals wanting to, to to approve that kind of activity. Great. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about the temporary license um, process in terms of the 120 days and kind of what to expect after that? Um, we've gotten some questions uh, regarding if people apply for a temporary license now, do they then have to apply for an annual license before that 120 days is up? So can we dig yes. into that just a bit more? So if you apply for a temporary now, um, you, you, at the time, right now, you don't have to, at the time you apply for a temporary, you don't have to apply for an annual license at that time. But sometime during that 120 days, you will have to submit that annual license before, in order for us to even give you an extension. So um, at any point in that 120 days, you will have to submit that annual license. Otherwise, if we don't have that, we cannot extend that temporary if we weren't able to issue that annual license. So I think uh, the thing I'd like to see is people at least getting on our website and applying for the temporary now. 
and then then they can start navigating and see what they need for the annual because there's a lot more information they're going to have to provide for the annual so it's going to take more time so get your temporary in because that that's the minimal amount of information it's not very i mean i i think if you have um, most of the items already on hand you're going to be able to get through it in 20 minutes mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe after January 1st, then, then, then worry, then start gathering the documents for the annual license. But yes, you have to get it in before that 120 days expires. Okay, great. Um, and what if you live in a locale that currently has no regulations on the books, you're hoping to apply for a local permit, um, can you apply after January 1st um, and, and try to get a temporary license after that? Well, for the temporary licenses, the statute is is very clear that you're going to have to have some kind of some kind of authorization from the local jurisdiction. However, if there's no ordinance in place right now and you want to apply for an annual license, you can. Again, for the annual license and there's no ordinance in place, we have to, you're not going to be able to submit anything to us. We're going to notify that local jurisdiction. If they don't get back to us in that 60 days, then the Bureau can assume compliance and issue the license. Okay. However, for the temporary, there's going to have to be some kind of authorization from the locals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, great. So question here, um, their city would allow them to be open until 11 p.m., but the state says 10. Who wins? Yeah. <laughs> I know. The state wins on that one. Okay. Um, probably not what they want to hear. Now the locals could be more restrictive, so they could close you at 9 p.m. and then the, the locals would win on that one, but mm -hmm. this okay. one the state wins. Great. Um, so we've had a bunch of questions about um, testing. Um, how do samples get collected? Where do they get collected? Is the onus on the testing lab to get their folks out to these remote locations in order to pick up samples? Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, so, so once the distributor has in its possession the cannabis batch, they're going to notify the testing laboratory, and then they're going to send out a lab agent to collect the sample. So that is the responsibility of the labs to, to, to go and collect the sample. Um, it will have to be uh, videotaped any, while the sample is being text, uh, um, taken, and then once the lab agent has the sample, they can then transport it back to the laboratory. Okay. Um, we'll probably get more questions on that, so don't worry, folks. We will make sure that these uh, get over to Lori and her team if we're not able to, to get through them. I'm trying to condense them into uh, different areas, and again, we will be um, following this up with uh, two other webinars um, with the um, Department of Public Health and the California Department of Food and Agriculture. So we'll probably dive a little bit deeper into some of the questions that are coming in about manufacturing um, and cultivation. So how is the surety bond paid? Wow, that's a good question. So that you would have to get through an insurance agent. Okay. And so that's not through the state. That would be finding a private uh, insurance agent that would provide you with that surety bond. Um, the, probably the best resource on who to contact there would be the Department of Insurance. And okay. they've been uh, very proactive mm -hmm. in making sure that there's going to be uh, folks available to provide those surety bonds. Great, thank you. And then on that same vein, other um, insurance requirements that folks should know about? Yeah, again, I, I would um, I would refer people to the Department of Insurance website. They've got a lot of information, and I know the folks over there and Commissioner Dave Jones have done a lot of outreach mm -hmm. um, to make sure that our cannabis licensees will have will be able to get these services for insurance. Great. Um, so looking for a little bit more information on um, what is going to happen with products that are currently manufactured um, and are either um, planning to get to a, distri a distributor before the end of the year or a retail. Can you talk a little bit about that process and then also the packaging requirements? We will dig into that a little bit deeper uh, with the Department of Public Health. but. Yeah, I, yeah, a lot, some of the packaging stuff I'll, I'll leave to Department of Public Health, but 
during this time, at least for the distributor and the retailers that the Bureau is going to be handling, uh, whatever is in inventory at the time of licensure is going to be allowed to, to transition uh, with the exception of a couple of things. With, um, one, if there's any uh, cannabis goods that are over the 10 milligrams of THC, um, that's not going to be allowed to be sold or transported because that is in statute that that's required. And anything that's not in child resistant packaging, um, that is going to have to be in child resistant packaging before it leaves the retail location. So the retailer, uh, if they have product or the distributor has product that isn't in child resistant packaging, what they have in inventory, they can put it in uh, an, any, any kind of exit bag that would be considered child resistant. So it's everything that's in inventory at the time of licensure, can, it, they can go by whatever is being allowed in that transition period. Great. Um, if an applicant has been sanctioned by a city for non-compliant operations, operating without a license, will the BCC deny the application? You know, it's just going to depend. Um, it, it, it certainly isn't automatic denial. We will ask you to disclose that to us, and then we'll, depending on what license you're applying for and what the sanction was for, not necessarily. Okay. So... So general rule, always yeah. give it a shot. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we've gotten some um, great questions about pets and allowing mm -hmm. um, cannabis-infused products for pets, especially yeah. for CBDs. Is that um, on the horizon? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think it is on the horizon. Yeah. Um, uh, one of uh, under the Department of Consumer Affairs, I know the veterinary board has been active, and with their their board has been dealing with those kinds of issues at their board meetings. So uh, right now, that is the best resource for anybody that has questions about pets and cannabis use. Okay, great, thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit more about collectives um, and how? Um, the, uh, the sunset provision on collectives, and we've gotten a few different questions on that and um, sort of what's going to be allowed under that piece. Yeah, we're actually working on a document. We get so many questions on collectives, mm -hmm. and I'll be honest with you, I think we're all getting, everybody gets confused. Yeah. And so we are, uh, we are going to have a document that we're going to put on our website. Hopefully you're going to see that in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is that um, if if you're going to be a collective that's going to convert uh, to for-profit and conduct commercial cannabis activity, you're going to need a license with the state. Mm -hmm. But however, if you're going to remain a collective and you're following all the guidelines and the health and safety code and the attorney general guidelines, then they don't need to be licensed. Um, and then of course that sunsets at the end of the year. Uh, but if, if folks have more specific questions on that, I really encourage them to email us and we'll, we'll have a conversation with, their, with you because there's not a one size fits all answer for this um, because there's a lot of different structures out there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I know that we've gotten some questions as well about the remediation process. We'll probably talk a little bit more in depth about that, um, just in terms of if a product fails testing. Um, what does the process look now? How does it look now? Yeah, so if a product fails testing, it is allowed to be remediated up to two times. Um, and it's important to know, uh, we, we just, we don't tell you how to remediate it. That is that is up to you on what steps you're going to take, well, you know, whether it goes back to the cultivator or the manufacturer, it gets remediated. I think the important thing to know is once it's been remediated, it needs to go back through testing in that final form, okay. and it has to pass through testing. After two, fail, after two failed remediations, that product would have to be uh, destructed. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few other questions that are coming in here about um, a little bit more clarity around the deadline for when folks can apply for a temporary. Does that have to be before January 1st? Oh, that's a, I'm so glad you brought that up because we, no, no, you can, no, <laughs> no, you can, temporary, you can, temporaries are, are going to be around for at least all through the end of 2018. So at any point in time, 
because a lot of people don't have their local license permit or authorization. So, and we get that. And a lot of them are, I think the, you know, the cities and counties are trying to catch up. So anytime throughout 2018, you can apply for a temporary, anytime. Great. Um, and we've gotten some more about the, um, the event license. Um, so only retailers are allowed to sell cannabis at an event. Um, does that, does, so farmers markets, that type of thing is kind of off the table at this point. Yeah, it is because of how the statute's written. Mm -hmm. I think it says fairground or district agricultural areas. And unless that farmers market was in one of those, uh, in, on a fairgrounds, then it, we, we could not issue uh, an event authorization there. Okay. Great. And um, a little bit more about micro businesses. The BCC is going to be managing the micro business despite the fact that someone could have a retail and a cultivation license or would um, the CDFA be managing, would Cal Cannabis be managing that cultivation piece? Yeah. Um, so the micro business is, is a, it's one license that's going to be issued by the Bureau. Uh, we will be consulting. So if you're gonna, you're gonna, you're, if, one, if one of the activities you choose to do is cultivation, we will be consulting with uh, Department of Food and Ag to make sure that we're following all their requirements for cultivation. And the same goes if you're gonna do the manufacturing, we're gonna be consulting with uh, Department of Public Health. So you're gonna have to be in compliance with all of their regulations to do that activity. But it is one license issued by the Bureau. So you're really only gonna be dealing with the licensing uh, activities with the Bureau and all of the activities have to be on the same premises. So you couldn't have like half of it, you know, at one location and then at a different address do some of do the distribution or retail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, great. So question that just came in, um, if a qualified patient collective is selling um, cannabis in 2018 to patients and other collectives, do they need that state license? Yeah, that would be a question I'd want, I, I would want to talk directly with our legal staff with, because okay. I, I, you know, to make sure we understand how that collective set up and because we don't want to give you, I don't want to give you incorrect information. So I think it's important to, for, for those specific questions mm -hmm. to call us directly. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so this is a, a little bit on manufacturing, but it kind of crosses over to distribution. If you're a manufacturer that is also going to hold a distribution license, do you need a separate premises for the distribution? You know, I think you're going to have to have an area where you're going to show if you're, uh, depending on which distribution license you're going to get, mm -hmm. I think it depends whether you're just going to do the transport versus you're going to do the full distributors. Uh, all of the activities. So I think in either case, there's probably going to have to be an area where it's just going to show where the cannabis is going to be stored before it goes out to transport. But I think uh, I think the delineation could be, I, I don't know that you need, uh, you have to have, you know, complete separation with walls and stuff. I think it just depends on the activity. Okay. Um, can you please talk about self-distribution, which distribution license to obtain, um, and whether that allows distribution to other of other licensees' products. So, with the with the full distribution license, you could distribute anybody's products, okay. um, or you could be a cultivator or manufacturer and get a distribution license and just do your own or others. And for the distributor transport, uh, you can transport your own product if you're like a cultivator and all you want to do is just transport your own product or you can get it to transport other people's product. And if you look at our license fees, we've like scaled that based on whether you're only going to distribute, you're only going to transport your own product. So that's a cheaper cost than if you're going to do other people's product. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we're getting some questions um, about um, payments to um, the CDTFA in cash. Um, I know we don't have um, anyone in the office today to speak to that, but maybe you could touch on that a little bit in terms of how um, folks are going to be able to pay in cash. For their taxes. Yes. Yeah. So I know uh, that CDTFA, um, I think their policy is not to accept cash, but they will allow for a waiver for cannabis businesses that need to pay cash at their district offices. So 
Uh, I believe you can go on their website and get a waiver form and ask to come to their district office to pay the cash. Um, the other thing is we're also establishing a, a North Coast office. So it looks like we're going to be in Humboldt County. We have to have that office established by July 1 and that will also include CDTFA. They have, they're going to be at this same office with the Bureau and Public Health and Food and Ag and we're all going to be able to take licensing fees and taxing fees at that location and then hopefully over the you know next year we'll have more regional offices where we're taking mm -hmm. uh, you know licensing and taxing fees okay great yeah the, the the takeaway from from the CDTFA is to call and make an appointment before you show up <laughs> um, and also yes the CDTFA did just release their emergency regulations as well so um, We'll be brushing up on all of that stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the Type S license, what that is, if it's coming online? I think is that the shared S, yeah, facilities? Yeah, the shared facilities. So I know that is those regulations are currently under development by the Department of Public Health. Okay. And I don't believe there's any details quite yet, but I believe they, were, they will be doing an emergency package, uh, emergency regulation package for shared facility, and I think they're on target to have that out before the end of the year, mm -hmm. so very soon. Done. Okay, great. Um, can we talk a little bit about what other um, educational um, either workshops or um, outreach that the BCC will be doing over the next several months so that folks can um, stay informed? Yes. So uh, I'll start with our online system. We have some e-learning tools out there that show you how to navigate our online system. We're going to also have something up really. We're going to do a webinar also on how to use our online system. So that's going to be available hopefully this week. Um, and then uh, you're going to see us go immediately to doing some more licensing workshops similar to what we did in October. Uh, we're, we're planning on doing five licensing workshops the last two weeks of January. I think we fall into a couple of days into February. And we're going to invite all of the state agency involved in cannabis regulation. So you're going to see public health, food and ag, all the taxing authorities, fish and wildlife, water resources. Um, and it'll be like it was before uh, when we did in October, we did a similar thing, but at that time the regulations hadn't been released. We didn't have as much information. Now we're going to be able to, add, now that the regulations are out, now that we're issuing licenses, it's a great uh, opportunity for people to come ask us questions um, and have like a one-on-one -on -one with, we're going to have a lot of bureau staff there. And so uh, we'll probably have that announced I'm looking over know, at looking Alex, Alex. our communication. <laughs> Probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll have all of our location and dates. Great. Excellent. Um, well, there will be lots of opportunities. Um, what are some final tips that you can give folks? Um, also, I want to let people know that if you did send in questions and we didn't have an opportunity to answer them, I'm going to be sending them over um, to the team at the BCC, um, and we will um, include your emails um, so that hopefully between all of us we can um, we can get everyone updated on all their questions. We really do appreciate this. This is a, a great way um, for um, not only CCIA uh, to, to learn about your questions, but also hopefully get them channeled to yeah. the, the right place to get answered. Um, yeah, any final final tips or thoughts you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, I, I you know, we're going to add to, we have a 1-800 number that people can call for questions. We have a call center. Um, they can answer some of the basic questions, but whatever we can't answer, we'll refer them to somebody that can get back to them. Mm -hmm. So any questions we get here today, like I said, if you give us their email address, we, we want you to be well informed. I, by the way, thank you for having me here today. I think this is tremendous opportunity, and I love that people are so engaged. But I'm going to say, Go apply for a temporary, like, uh, because we really need to get as many people licensed as we can, and we really want to try to make the process as easy as possible. And if and if you're having trouble navigating, let us know, and then we'll 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 make we'll make corrections to the system if we need to put more information out if somebody's confused about something uh, we we intend to keep putting out more materials out there to help people navigate uh, the license licensing application process our regulations because we know it's a lot of information for people to take yeah. in so sure is. we're here we're yeah. here to we really do 
want to make sure we're answering your questions. Yeah, great. Um, well, we'll make sure that all of these questions um, get over to, to the right place. And, and um, I really want to thank Lori for joining us and the whole team at the BCC for all their hard work uh, in getting these emergency regulations together. Uh, January 1st is right around the corner. We're all excited and nervous. And um, I also really want to thank um, Nine Point Strategies for helping us put together this awesome webinar. It's the first one that CCIA has done. And uh, we're looking forward to doing more in 2018. But we couldn't have done it without you all. Um, and I also really want to thank Justin McCarthy and Josh Drayton, um, awesome CCIA staffers that helped put all of this together. So um, hopefully you found this informative. Please give us some feedback. If not, I can always be reached at Lindsay, spelled with an A, at cacannabisindustry.org. Um, hopefully you'll join us. We're starting our next uh, webinar at 2 p.m. Uh, with the Department of Public Health. If you haven't RSVP'd for that, um, you can uh, shoot me an email. Uh, or uh, take a look at the last uh, reminder link that we just sent out for this one. It also has <laughs> more information on the next webinars. Okay, that's it. Signing off. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.